Well, hello, hello, and good afternoon. Um, we are uh, going live um, a little bit early. Um, if you're uh, if you're here, um, if you're here with us, hello and welcome. Um, let me be the first, if no one else has, to uh, wish you a happy Friday. And uh, hopefully it's not um not going too shabby. All right, we've got our we've got our first first comment of the day. How is it going, Raj? Um, this is a this is the first time, uh, my first time, um, live casting after our abysmal uh, lecture on Wednesday. Um, probably the worst uh, live session um, that I've ever done um, from a technical difficulties perspective, uh, and it turns out that. Uh, Technical difficulties, um, excuse me, have a uh, dramatic effect on uh, the user experience. So, um, I I spent uh, the rest of uh, Wednesday uh, and uh, yesterday doing a little trouble shooting. Oh, I'm glad. Um, Raj says it's good so far. Um, I am. I'm glad about that. I believe. Um, I believe I sorted out the uh, the business. So um, my hope is uh, and expectation that today's office hours will go smooth and that um, that I've kind of solved, figured out what was going bad. Um, what was going bad on uh, what day was that? Wednesday. Today's Friday. Um, I am. As far as a uh, song of the day goes, um, I am definitely still on um, my my stoner metal kick. Um, this one's a little more uh, chill. It's not not quite as aggressive as the Mastodon stuff. Um, in your spare time, you should check out check out the song Demon Cleaner. Um, by the inimitable Caius, um, a band that kind of invented the genre. Hey, Winnie. Um, if you haven't heard of Caius, they they, um, like I said, kind of invented it least defined the genre of uh of stoner metal though it definitely has its harder um edges it can also have kind of a smoother feel and uh anyways check out this track it's pretty pretty dope all right you have a question um oh um question that occurred today um uh hit me Let's uh let's dive right in. What is your question? Because we don't we don't have any emailed in questions uh, at least as of uh, a couple minutes ago. So this will all all be uh open open ended. There is no uh, pre programmed content for today. Only what you ask live. You could totally email it in if you have a picture, um, or you could, or you could ask in the comments. I'll respond uh, either way. Let's see how much energy in kilojoules per mole is involved 
from the transition of an electron from the uh, orbital n equals 4 to n equals 7 energy level, what was the energy absorbed or emitted by that particular electron? How could you tell? Okay, so the first thing um, that hits me about this problem is they are giving us um, two orbits. They're saying that there's a transition from n equals 4 to n equals 7. So n equals 4 is our initial, n equals 7 is our final orbit. So automatically, because our orbit energy level is increasing, um, we already know here that energy is absorbed. All right, because we're moving the electron farther from the nucleus. Um, so we already know that energy is absorbed. It's going to be a positive value. So um, regardless of what numerical value this has, we know that the um, sign of that value should be positive and that energy is absorbed. So we can actually answer that um, from the beginning. Now, to calculate um, the energy, you'll notice they ask us something very specific. They ask, ask us to calculate the energy in kilojoules per mole. All right, and you'll see that the adding per mole thing um, is uh, is tricky of them. It adds a layer of detail that um, that we may or may not have interacted with yet. So, and you'll see where that comes in in a moment. First off, we're dealing with initial and final orbits, so I'm automatically thinking um, Rydberg, that the energy of this transition is going to equal the Rydberg constant times one over the initial orbit squared minus one over my final orbit squared. All right. And when I plug in those values, I've got one over four squared minus one over seven squared. Now this will take a little while to work out the math. This will be one over 16 um, minus one over uh, 49, I believe. Seven times seven is 49. Um, so um, we need to, um, well, actually, uh, Vraj, we don't need to find the wavelength because in the Rydberg equation, um, we already have uh, energy. Energy is equal to the Rydberg constant times uh, the difference between 1 over the initial orbit squared minus 1 over the final orbit squared. Um, so we need to find a common denominator for our um, fraction, right? Uh, 16 times 49 is 784. So this will be 49 over 784 minus 16 over 784, uh, still multiplied by RH. So 49 minus 16 is 33 over 784. And now we can uh, crunch our numbers because uh, RH, I believe, is 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. All right. Um, and now we got to crunch crunch some numbers. So we've got 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 times 33 divided by 784. 
Um, so our energy here comes out to be, oops, not zero. Um, 9.18 times 10 to the negative 20. Now, when you look at the units for this problem, all right, um, the only unit in play right now is joules, right? So this has units of joules, but when you look at what they ask for, they ask us to calculate the energy in kilojoules per mole. Now, this is where the problem takes an important uh, conceptual twist. This energy value that we calculated, this is the energy of one photon. All right, one photon, but they're asking for this question is asking for the energy of one mole of photons or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons, all right? So we're going to need to use Avogadro's number to do a unit conversion to find kilojoules per mole. The value that we have currently, this energy value is in joules per photon. And we need to convert this to kilojoules per mole. So let's open up a new slide. We have 9.18 times 10 to the negative 20. The units here are joules per photon. To convert from joules to kilojoules, we know that there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. All right, so joules cancel, leaving us with kilojoules. Now we need to convert from photons to moles, and they're 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons in one mole. And now we have the unit photon canceling with photons, leaving us with units of kilojoules per mole, um, and now we crunch our numbers one, one last time. So 9.18, let's see, multiply by everything in the numerator. Um, and then divided by a thousand comes out to B I and mean, we're limited to three sig figs. Uh, 55.3 kilojoules per mole. And that would be, um, that would be the answer. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, you did it a little bit different. You found the wavelength and then use that to find the energy, then convert. Um, well, so, so actually, I've got a same answer though. Okay, perfect. If you got the same answer, then um, then it's totally correct. That is. Here's the cool thing. The cool thing. The correct answer. And this is this is rules that I this, these are words that I live by. The correct. Answer is correct. The correct answer is correct. So if you got the right answer, 
then your method totally works. Um, often, with these word problems, there is a more than one way to skin the cat. So, well, well done. Um, are there other questions out there? Um, because again, like I, as I said earlier, um, I have received uh, zero emails today. So, so there's no uh, pre-programmed um, content. I'm just here to answer any uh, any questions the live crowd has. One easy one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Hit me. Let's see. All right. You hold a sealed, fully rigid, non-insulated jar. What an intriguing start to a problem. Containing only inert helium gas over a flame for 50 seconds. Which... Gas law variables are affected. All right, so let's break this down. We have a sealed fully rigid non insulated jar with helium gas period all right here's here's the deal the beginning of this problem is loaded with information this is like not just nachos this is like cheese and jalapenos and black olives and shredded beef and this is like the loaded nacho so there's so much information in that first sentence of this problem foremost of which i would say is sealed sealed means that no gas is escaping so that's constant moles fully rigid is code for that means the um the shape of this jar isn't changing. So we have a constant volume. All right, now the last one, non-insulated, means that our temperature is variable. So temperature can change here. Um, so when you look at the ideal gas constant. Whoa, I didn't want that to be yellow. Um, PV over NT. Um, we know that moles are constant. We also know that volume's constant. So yeah, Raj, you're totally correct temperature is variable which means that if temperature is changing pressure is also variable so we would say just as you said that pressure and temperature um, can change all right yeah okay they are directly proportional that is correct all right okay winnie Question, uranium-235 is uh, 
is fizzle um, and can be used for nuclear bombs. Yes. Oh, facile, probably. Um, however, it must have a purity of 80% uh, over uranium-238. Uranium-235 has a natural abundance of 0 0.720, while uranium-238 is abundance of 99.274%. To purify uranium-235, the mixture of isotopes is turned into UF-6 and subjected to a fusion or diffusion. What is the ratio of rates for the um, effusion of uranium-235 to uh, uranium-238? Okay, here, let me... Give me a hot second here. I'm going to bust out. Oops. Um, well, actually. I'm going to bust out my gas law lecture notes because there's an equation that we need. Um, that I just want to make sure I don't mess up. So wait, no, not Google Docs. Yeah, 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 238. Okay, let's see, drive. All right, so... This is a, uh, a gas law problem. Um, and it's taking advantage of um, rates of effusion. Which, all right. To a fusion, what what is the ratio of rates for the fusion? Okay, okay. So here's the deal. Um, turns out that um, so so a fusion, a, a, a little bit of a little bit of background. So this is um, oops, this is a uh, Winnie's. Winnie's question, and if you are uh, re-watching the live stream, you can read. Um, she wrote the question out in the um, in the comments, the live comments. You can see them there. Um, now, now a little bit of background. So, um, a fusion is a process by which a gas um, escapes from a container into a vacuum through a small hole. So, for example. If you had a gas trapped on one side of a barrier, right, where there's a small gap, so you've got your gas particles collected down here. Um, eventually, they're all going to slip through this small um, gap, and what will happen over time is the gas will start to escape. Maybe you've got like a couple dots down there. Let's see, I started with seven. And gas is going to continue to escape from the more concentrated side into the vacuum until you have a relatively even distribution of gas particles. Um, throughout the uh, the vessel um, and this process right here um, is called a fusion all right this process is called a fusion and the rate of a fusion turns out 
that the rate of effusion is inversely proportional to, um, I should say, inversely proportional to one over the square root of the molecular weight of the gas. So the heavier a gas is, the slower it will effuse. The lighter a gas is, the faster it will effuse. And in this problem, um, we're dealing with uh, two different isotopes of uranium. Um, one has a mass number of 235, one is 238. So one is larger and slower, one is smaller and faster. And they're asking us, what is the ratio of rates for effusion for uranium-35? And if you look up in chapter five, there's a section that talks about um, rates of effusion. And you'll find the following equation there, that the rate of effusion for gas A, let's say, the ratio of the rate of effusion for gas A to the rate of effusion for gas B is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of gas B over the molecular weight of gas A, all right? And um, so they're asking us, oh, okay, okay, Winnie, yes. Um, so, so your question, we've never learned this, right? Or am I missing like a whole topic. Okay, so here's the deal. I, um, so the way kind of Folsom Lake College has this set up is the gas laws are covered um, in uh, lab. So there's two lab lectures that your lab instructors do. So I don't explicitly cover um, gas laws, but, but, but then I told the class, because I still test on chapter five, that I test on the ideal gas law, combined gas law, and um, what was that other one? Dalton's law of partial pressure. So I don't test on the rates of effusion. Um, whether or not your lab instructor covers this is totally on them and they can choose to cover it or not, test on it or not in lab exams. But um, this is the equation that you need uh, to solve this problem. And here, um, basically what we gotta do is um, we pick something for B and we pick something for A. Um, so for B, for example, we could pick U um, 230, 238, F6. And for A, I could pick uh, U 235 F6 and this would be the ratio of the rate since A I selected as 235 the rate of the U 235 over the rate of effusion for U 238. So to solve this problem, we need to calculate um, these two molecular weights and then take the square root of their ratio. So um, -bum -bum -bum. So let's open a new slide and calculate some molecular weights. So U 238 F6, um, the atomic mass of uranium 238 is gonna be approximately 238. But um, let me look up an exact um, atomic mass. So Oops, that looks like FC. It's really just F6. Um, so U238 will have an atomic mass, has an atomic mass 
of 238.029 plus we got uh, fluorine's like 19.1. I believe, um, let me just, oh, well, close, but in the other direction, uh, fluorine, oh, look at that, is 18.998, um, but we have six of them, all right, so this will be 18.998 times six, plus 238.029 so this will be 352.017 amu and then for um for u235 f6 Grab the atomic mass for uranium-235. That is 235.044 plus 18.998 times 6. So 18.998 times 6 plus 235.044. 349.032 AMU. And with both of these in hand, we can now calculate the rate of effusion, the ratio of the rates of effusion for the 235 F6 over the 238 F6 because it's equal to the square root of three fifty two point zero one seven over three forty nine point zero three two. So let's crunch these numbers three fifty two point zero one seven divided by 349.032 and let's take square root so this comes out to be uh, 1.004 ish all right um, now Check this out. So, uh, so Salvesh, you got 0.9967. Raj, you got 0.9957. Um, and I got 1.004. You may be going, what? What the heck's going on? Um, but what you guys did, so, so. Your guys' answers are totally 100% correct, and here's why. Raj and Salvish, you both found the ratio, just the, the inverted ratio, the rate of U238 F6 over the rate of U235 F6, which does come out to be 
Um, I'm getting five, eight. All right, they're they're basically the same. Um, okay, yeah, 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 five, seven. Um, both of these are 100% correct because um, there's no set um, definition for which gas you put on top. You're just taking a ratio, and there's two different ways to do that. You either put 235 up top or 238 up top, um, and it's fine. It's fine either way. So your values are also correct. Um, but if you did 235 on top, then you'd come out with what I got, which is... 1.004. Totally. Okay, Raj, you told me you emailed me a question. Now I'm checking my email to see if it's true. All right. Or, oh, hang on. It's not an email, it's a, it's a canvas. Let's take a look. Oh, I'm like, why isn't it opening? It's downloading. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at this dude. All right, calculate the delta H for the following reaction. Use the following reactions and delta H's. Okay. Um, so this is a, a Hess's law, Hess's law problem. Um, for those of you who uh, do not see the uh, picture that I am currently looking at. Um, I'm going to um, gonna write the problem. So we have a reaction between uh, methane gas and oh no no, no sorry, getting ahead of myself. Oh, wait, no, 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 I, I had it right. Hang on. We have a reaction between methane gas and chlorine gas that produces carbon tetrachloride, also a gas, and HCl. And they want to know what is the delta H for this reaction, all right? And we're given we're given three reactions. The first is a reaction of carbon and hydrogen to produce methane. So this is a formation reaction with a delta H of negative 74.6 units are kilojoules per mole. Uh, the second reaction is solid carbon reacting with chlorine gas to produce carbon tetrachloride. And the delta H here is negative 90, whoa, 95, excuse me, 0.7 kilojoules per mole. Finally, they give us a reaction between hydrogen gas and chlorine gas. Oh, that's ugly. to produce HCl and this is a delta H of negative 92.3 kilojoules per mole. All right, now what we wanna notice here What we want to notice is, um, so we need to first observe 
our targets, right? Our target goals. We want to have one mole of methane, of carbon tetrahydride, on the reactant side, right, of this equation. And you can see that we have carbon tetrahydride here, but it's on the product side, right? So we are going to need to flip our reactants and our products. And when we do that, you need to multiply your delta H by negative one. Next, you'll notice that we need, well, actually, I'm not gonna do that one next. Um, well, I will, I will label this B, C, and D. All right. Um, we need carbon tetrachloride as a product. And you can see that in the second equation, it's already there as a product. Um, uh, oh, Raj, your question. They are just K. Uh, they're not kilojoules per mole. Um, actually, um, change in enthalpy. Um, change in enthalpy is always, um, always measured in kilojoules per mole. Um, sometimes people get lazy. And, uh, and don't write out the, uh, the per mole parts, um, but I don't get lazy, um, and I force myself to write out the per mole part. So, um, not that you'd be tested on that; you'd have no way of knowing that. But that's why I wrote them out in kilojoules per mole, even though the original problem has them just written as kilojoules. I know. Um, so. Okay, so we've got A placed, right? We've got to flip that over. We've got C already placed, so we don't have to mess with um, carbon tetrachloride. But one thing you'll notice is for D and, um, so for, for D, it's already on the correct side of the equation. Um, but you'll notice that we only have two of them and we need four of them. So we need to multiply everything in this third equation by four, sorry, not four, by two. Which means we need to multiply our delta H by two as well. Now let's see um, how this changes things. All right, so let's take a look. So with our um, first equation, um, with our first equation, we were flipping that around, right? So we now have CH4 gas producing solid carbon and two moles of H2 and this is a delta H of positive 74.6 kilojoules per mole. All right. Now with the second equation, we said we were leaving it as is. It's just uh, carbon tetrachloride gas, gas being produced from uh, solid carbon and Cl2. 
So we don't have to mess with this delta H at all. It's just negative 95.7 kilojoules per mole. And then finally, with our last reaction, we multiplied everything by two. So we've got two H2, two, hydrogen, two moles of hydrogen gas plus two moles of chlorine gas produces four moles of gaseous HCl. And this doubles our delta H. So this will be negative, let's see, 92.3, um, negative 180, uh, 184, excuse me, 0.6 kilojoules per mole. All right, now, now when we add everything in this chemical equation, you'll notice that we have two moles of H2 on the reactants and product side. Sorry, I forgot to write my phase up here. So these cancel. We have one mole of solid carbon being on the uh, product side, one mole of so solid carbon on the reactant side. So those two cancel. And that's all that cancels. This will leave us with CH4 plus, here you'll notice, we have Cl2 and Cl2 on the same side. So these add together, right? Plus 4Cl2 produces 4HCl plus CCl4. Sorry, everything here is in the gas phase. All right, and that was the target reaction we were going for. We want to know what the delta H for this reaction is. And the delta H for this reaction is going to be the sum of these three values that we have here. So 74.6, whoa, 74.6 plus, well, let's see, it's a negative 95.7 minus 184.6 gives us a delta H of negative 205.7 kilojoules per mole. Um, our significant digits don't have to be adjusted because you can see that each number that we added has its last significant digit in the tenths place and our answer has its last significant digit in the tenths place. So this is our final answer. So that is the answer to this Hess's law problem. And I um, apologize again for the confusion over uh, the kilojoules per mole cropping up, but um, delta H is always measured uh, in kilojoules per mole. Heck yeah. Well done, dude. Totally. Oh, there's a second part to this problem. I was like, I'm like, and we're chilling. Let's see. Okay. So uh, you carried out the above experiment by ignoring any heat exchange with the calorimeter itself. What would the enthalpy change of reaction? Oh, sorry. What would the enthalpy change of reaction? How would the enthalpy change of reaction one be affected if heat exchange with the calorimeter was not ignored. Okay, so let's see. Reaction one um, is uh, the formation of CH4. Um, 
Um, so basically, the, so 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 this is more of a uh, conceptual question, and and what they're saying is um, in this series of reactions, we're ignoring the fact that we're losing some of the heat to the calorimeter, right? We're getting these answers. We're calculating our delta H's, but the reality is the calorimeter is absorbing some of it, all right? There's some heat lost. Um, and by choosing to ignore that, our numbers are actually slightly lower. So if we were doing a more rigorous job, we would calculate how much energy is lost to the calorimeter perimeter, how much is absorbed by the calorimeter itself, um, and then add that back. So our delta H's um, would all be slightly higher after correcting for the energy lost um, to the surroundings during this experiment's um, progress. Does that make sense? So that's the answer to the calorimetry part. There's always a little bit of energy eking out into the environment. And if we were to take that into account, we would need some way to measure it so that we could calculate it and then add that back to our initial values. Are there other questions out there? Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. It's kind of, it is kind of a nice follow up question. It's conceptual, doesn't add any math. Um, you know, not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. Let me see if anything has popped popped up in the mail. Nope, nothing so far. So one 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 question that I have for you is the um the timeless question. Of Beans versus robots. Oh, you have one. Okay, okay. Forget my question. Let's talk about actual chemistry. Email it to me. Word on the street is it's kind of big. All right, I got my eye on the inbox. Let's see, the pass Chen series for the emission spectrum this uses this question actually has a little bit of conceptual calculus. So, so when they ask, um, so the question is, What is um, let's see what is the highest the highest energy um, wavelength or photon? Um, in this series, which is when our initial orbit is infinity. All right, that sounds like an impossible thing to calculate, but remember, we're dealing with the Rydberg equation here, and energy is equal to Rh 
times 1 over our initial orbit squared minus 1 over our final orbit squared. All right. And um, when we're talking about our largest, so they're asking for highest energy, which means we need to be thinking about our largest transition, right? Because the larger the transition, the higher energy photon is going to be absorbed or emitted. Now, the largest transition would have to be an electron going from infinitely far away, so n equal infinity, whoa, okay, I promise I can draw an infinity symbol. Now the pressure's on, it's, it's kind of crappy, but, um, but it'll get by, get me by, hopefully. Um, so n largest transition will be n equals infinity, dropping down into n equals one, right? Now, this is our initial, and this is our final. Let's look what'll happen to our Rydberg equation. So this will be equal to RH over one, or sorry, times one over infinity squared minus one over one squared. Now, the second expression right here, this is just equal to one, right? The first expression, however, one over infinity, whenever you divide by infinity, it equals zero. So that simplifies our expression. Our largest possible energy transition would just be RH times zero minus one. So it'd just be negative one times RH. This is the energy of the highest, or I should say, let me rephrase that. This right here is the largest possible transition. Because you traveled the largest possible distance where initial is equal to infinity which makes that first term drop to zero and landing as close as you possibly can where n is one is n is one um or a righto <laughs> oh my gosh raj you cracked me up um Oh my gosh, this is so good. Um, okay, now Whitney, the, um, the answer to your question, what is the lowest energy wavelength? Um, now, Remember, so 
So, so when... When they ask the question... What is the lowest... energy wavelength or photon um when when they say lowest energy they're talking about the smallest transition all right lowest energy is the smallest transition um and for the um, Rydberg equation, um, um, for the Rydberg equation, you want so so when you calculate, for example, the transition. excuse me, from n equals 2 to n equals 1 versus the transition from n equals 3 to n equals 2, even though these are each one orbit away, because of the Rydberg equation and the way the mathematics are structured, this is actually a smaller transition um, with a lower energy. So the lowest energy photon possible the lowest energy photon possible will be the photon released or absorbed um, between the uh, that will, will, will belong to the transition between the highest and second highest possible orbital or orbit. All right. I don't know for this particular series off the top of my head what the two highest um, orbits are, but um, look them up in your book. And um, those two uh, the, will be will give you the lowest energy uh, wavelength, the smallest possible transition. Let's see. Or one ninth. The uh I I don't I'm not actually sure off the top of my head. Um I don't know the numbers for the uh the past gen series. Um off the top of my head, so I'd have to look them up. And I don't have them in front of me at the moment. Okay. Here, hang on. 
I'm grabbing uh, Raja's new problem. Okay, let's see. So new problem. You wish to determine the dissociation enthalpy of acetic acid. You decide to perform two calorimetry experiments to determine the heat of dissociation. Um, for the first, you mix uh, 25 um, 0 0.0 milliliters of 1.25 molar sodium hydroxide with 30 milliliters of 1.15 molar uh, hydrochloric acid. The cor corresponding chemical equations is etc. Overall change in temperature for the reaction was positive 8.6 degrees C. Um, for the second, they tell us that we mix 30 milliliters of 1.9 molar sodium hydroxide with 20 milliliters of 2.5 molar acetic acid. Give us the chemical equation. Um, and they tell us that the change in temperature for the reaction was 12.5 degrees C. Assuming that the individual and mixed solutions have densities and specific heat capacities. Um, mixed solution have densities and specific heat capacities. And then they give us a specific heat capacity equivalent to that of pure water. Use Hess's law and the heats of reaction from the two calorimetry experiments to calculate the dissociation um, enthalpy of acetic acid. Show all your work. Okay, this problem is huge. This problem is awesome. Um, let's get into this. So, first and foremost, um, this is a Hess's Law problem at its heart. They give us this equation. All right, they give us acetic acid. I'm dissociating into hydronium and acetate and they ask us to find the delta H for this reaction and they give us a couple things here um, they give us two reactions one is sodium hydroxide which is aqueous reacting with Aqueous, oops, hydrochloric acid. To produce liquid water. And sodium chloride. Um, they give us another reaction. And our second reaction is sodium hydroxide, again, reacting with whoa, sloppy acetic acid. This makes water. and sodium acetate. Oh, not a gas. It's also not a B. And they want us to find the delta H for a reaction. So first off, um, this is a Hess's law problem. So we need to, um, I'm rolling up my sleeves cause I'm, I'm getting excited. We need to take these reactions and manipulate them into this goal of a reaction up here. This is what we're after. 
we need to derive this reaction from the reactions given. Um, it's a Hess's law problem, but we're going to have to draw on several different concepts. The first of which, um, in this first reaction, you'll notice that we have several aqueous compounds. All right, it's currently written as a chemical equation, but I'm gonna rewrite this as a total ionic equation. You'll remember that we can, instead of writing them as associated, write sodium hydroxide as aqueous, free-floating aqueous sodium ions and aqueous free-floating hydroxide ions for strong acids like hydrochloric acid, we can do the same. H plus plus Cl minus produces liquid water. Plus sodium plus chloride. All right, and you'll notice we have several spectator ions here. Sodium and sodium cancel with each other. Chloride, I'm gonna use a different color. Chloride and chloride cancel with each other. So we're just left with this reaction between OH and H plus producing H2O. We can do the same thing here. I'm gonna break up sodium hydroxide. Um, I'm not gonna break up acetic acid because it is not a strong acid. This will produce water plus the ionic compound, which we can break up, sodium acetate. All right, and now here, sodium cancels sodium, and that's it. All right, now, let's take a moment. Let's take a moment. We want to find the delta H for the dissociation of acetic acid into aqueous hydronium and aqueous acetate. All right, we're after this delta H. And we've just broken down the two equations that they gave us um, into net ionic equations. So we have these two equations, H aqueous H plus plus aqueous hydroxide producing water, which is a liquid. And then we have a second reaction with aqueous hydroxide plus, oops, um, aqueous acetic acid producing water and acetate. All 
I'm sorry, that looks like there's five hydrogens and acetate. There's only three. All right, now you'll notice that we have acetic acid already on the product side of reaction two, which is awesome. Um, we have hydronium on the reactant side of our first reaction. So we're going to need to swap our products and reactants, right? And then you'll notice that we have acetate on the product side of reaction two. So that's already good. All right. So we, we know how to solve the Hess's law portion of this problem, right? Here's the catch. We know we need to multiply delta H of reaction one by negative one. We get to leave the delta H for reaction two alone. The problem here is we don't know what these are. All right, we can do the Hess's law stuff, manipulate our reactions around to add them together to get the final reaction we're after, but we don't know what these changes in enthalpies are. And that's where all of the volumes and molarities and change in temperatures come in, all right? Because here's what we do know. Delta H is always measured in terms of energy per mole. In other words, the numerator for this thing is Q, thermal energy. The denominator for this thing is moles specifically of the limiting reactant. All right, so what we need to do with all the information given for the reaction of sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid and the reaction of sodium chloride with acetic acid is we need to determine the limiting reactant for each, because that'll be the denominator for our delta H, and we need to determine the thermal energy absorbed, all right? So we're gonna do that for these two reactions, then we're gonna come back to this slide and use Hess's law to calculate the delta H for this reaction. All right, this problem is awesome. Gnarly, but awesome. All right, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So, reaction one. Reaction one has NaOH reacting with HCl. To produce water and sodium chloride. And we're told that we have 1.25 molar, 25 mils of sodium chloride, and that we have 30 milliliters. of 1.15 molar HCl. So limiting reactant time, all right? Limiting reactant time. We take our 1.25, this is molar, right? Moles of sodium hydroxide over liters, and we multiply by our volume 
in leaders. Then we're interested in what's limiting. So we need to convert to moles of product. Now this is a mole to mole, uh, sorry, a one to one mole ratio. So technically you don't have to do this last part, but I'm just writing it here um, to be, <laughs> Uh, to be complete, um, if you recognize that this is a one-to-one -one mold ratio and you don't feel like writing that last part in, I don't blame you, but um, I want to be technically correct so that you could use this on any chemical equation, even when there isn't a one-to-one -one mold ratio. And I don't want to lead you wrong if you're dished a different type of equation in the future. So... 1.25 times 0 0.025. This gives us 0 0.0313 moles of one of our product, which is H2O. Now let's do the same thing for HCl. So that's 1.15 moles per liter times our volume in liters, 0 0.0300. And again, for completeness sake, I'm going to convert this to moles of one of our two products, the same one that I did in the previous part of this problem. So 1.15 times 0 0.03 is 0 0.0345 moles H2O. So the limiting reagent is here, and this is going to be our denominator for our delta H calculation for the first reaction now for the second part we need to know what q is and we know that q is equal to mcat now we're told to assume that we're dealing with the specific heat of water and the density of water. Density of water is 1.008 grams per mil. Specific heat, 4.184 joules per gram degree C. Um, we're told our delta T in this problem for this first reaction is a positive 8.4 degrees C. We're not given our mass, but we know the volume of solution is right here. It's the volume of these two solutions combined, 25 plus 30. So our volume of solution is 55.0 milliliters, which means we can use the density and the volume to find our mass. So Q is equal to, oops, Fifty five point zero milliliters times one point zero zero eight grams per milliliter times four point one eight four joules per gram degree C times eight point four degrees Celsius. So 
So 55.0 times 1.008 times 4.18, oops, 4.184. Just making sure that my decimal is a little more explicit there. 4.184 times 8.84. So this gives us a Q, and let's see if we can keep two sig figs here of 1,948. We're only keeping two. Um, and our units here are joules because milliliters cancel, grams cancel, degrees C cancels. So finally, our delta H for reaction one is 1,948 joules divided by 0 0.0313 moles. So this comes out to be a lot of joules. Um, I'm going to switch this to kilojoules because it's just easier to manage. Um, we can only keep two sig figs because remember, we only have two sig figs in our numerator. So this will be 62 kilojoules per mole. Is the change in enthalpy for reaction one. Now let's calculate the change in enthalpy of reaction two. Hang on. Did I miss something? Probably, let me take a look at the problem. Ah, uh, yes, because uh, energy was released. So sorry, let me put a corrective negative sign right there, right there in my numerator. Great catch, Raj. Yes, it totally would be negative. All right, so that is, um, I, with the way I was rounding, came out with 62. Um, I'm sure 63 is fine as well. Um, but the negative is, um, is important. Now we have to do the same for the second reaction. So it's, you're going to notice, and this will go a little faster because we know what we're doing now. But this is going to be the exact same process. We have sodium hydroxide reacting with acetic acid. Producing water and sodium acetate. All right, and we're given, let's see, we have 1.95 molar sodium hydroxide. We've got 30 mils of it. And for acetic acid, we have 20 mils of 2.5 molar. So first we need to calculate the limiting reactant. We've got 1.95 moles of sodium hydroxide per liter multiplied by our volume in liters. 
and then converting to moles of a one of our two products. Again, it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio here, so, so things work out. Moles of sodium hydroxide cancel, liters cancel. If sodium hydroxide is the limiting reactant in this portion of the problem, we'll have 1.95 times 0 0.03 or 0.58. five moles I need to I just realized address something that's technically wrong on my previous slide um technically right here this needs to be moles of the limiting reactant. Now, it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so it's fine. So we do use that value, but it's not moles of water that goes in our denominator, it's moles of limiting reactant. So I just wanted to rectify that because what I had written down there was technically wrong. Um, okay, so now we need to rinse and repeat the same calculation for um, acetic acid. We, uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Okay, um, now we need to... Um, okay, so now we need to do um, the, uh, the second one. So we have 2.50 moles, oops, C2H3O2 per liter times 0 0.0200 liters. And again, this is to test our limiting reactant. All right, let's crunch these numbers. 2.5 times 0 0.02. All right, comes out to be 0 0.0500 moles. All right, and because, only because we're dealing with a one-to-one -one mole ratio, um, this will be our denominator for our calculation for delta H. Um, now we're gonna do the same thing we did last time with Q equals MCAT. Um, we're given our delta T, our mass, we use our volume, total volume of solution, and the density for water. And we're also told to use the specific heat capacity for water. So we have 50.0 milliliters times 1.008 grams per milliliter. Times our specific heat capacity 
4.184 joules per gram degree C times our change in temperature, which we were told that the temperature of the surroundings increased by 12.5. That means the reaction itself lost 12.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Crunching these numbers, we've got 50 times 1.008 times 4.184 times 12.5. Um, milliliters cancel, grams cancel, degrees Celsius cancels. So we get a value for Q uh, that is equal to negative 2,635.9. Um, and we get to keep here three significant figures. One, two, three. All right. Now for our delta H. It's going to be equal to the amount of thermal energy released. And our units here are joules. Three sig figs in the numerator divided by the moles of limiting reagent. Just point zero five zero. Zero. So our delta H here, and again, I'm just going to do the unit switch to kilojoules because it makes things more manageable. Here is a negative 52.7 kilojoules per mole. And this is the delta H for reaction two. Okay. This may be the longest problem ever written in the history of science. Um, let's take a look. So, where are we? Um, oh, I need to grab. Okay. Okay. So, r remember what we're doing here. Because we've, I feel like we might be a little lost in the reeds. I know my brain feels lost in the reeds. Um, Remember, we had manipulated these two reactions. We had manipulated these two reactions so that they'd add up to the ionization of acetic acid, um, which is what we're after, right? The problem was we didn't know what these delta H's were. Now that we do, we can calculate, um, we can calculate our delta H for the reaction in question. All right, so let's, let's go there. So first, our first reaction Um, we had to swap them around, right? We had our first reaction, which has liquid water, after we wrote the net ionic equation for it, is equal to aqueous hydronium plus hydroxide. Hydroxide's not a gas, it's in the aqueous phase. And our delta H here, well, the delta H for reaction one was negative uh, 62 kilojoules per mole, but we had to flip it around. So it is now a positive, that's the weirdest two I've ever written, uh, a positive 62.0. No, not 62.0, just 62. All right, our second reaction, which has aqueous hydroxide reacting with acetic acid, also aqueous, 
going to water and acetate. Um, we just calculated this delta H as negative 52.7 kilojoules per mole. Now we want to add these two reactions together. And you'll notice that we have hydroxides canceling and we have water canceling, leaving us with the ionization of acetic acid, which is what we were tasked to calculate uh, the change in enthalpy for. So that's two oxygens. So here's our ionization. such an ugly aqueous symbol I'm going to rewrite it all right and the delta H for this reaction is the sum of the previous two so we have 62 minus 57 point sorry minus 52.7 is positive 9.3 but we can only keep one sig fig so 9 kilojoules per mole. Sorry, it's not that we can only keep one sig fig, but we have to round to the ones place. And that is, that is the um, answer. Ah, Winnie, okay, why do we use Q equals MCAT and not Q of reaction. Um, so the reason, okay, so Winnie, that is an excellent question. Um, the reason why is in this case, um, Q equals MCAT does give us the Q for this reaction. Um, and it's based on the information we're given in the problem. So you'll notice if you go back and look at it, that we know the volume and density, which gives us the mass we're told the specific heat and we're told, told the change in temperature. So the only way for us to calculate um, the change in thermal energy is by using Q equals MCAT. Let's see, since these reactions are done in the calorimeter, do we have to take into account the heat loss transfer to the calorimeter? Winnie, that is another excellent question. And we don't only because they didn't provide us that information. If they had told us how much energy was lost to the calorimeter, then we would have to take that into account. But since they did not, um, excuse me. I'm so sorry for that yawn. Um, it's not because I'm bored doing what I'm doing. Um, it's because I was, uh, awake at five 30 this morning. Um, since they didn't give us that information, Winnie, we don't have to take that into account with our calculation. If they had, then we totally would have. Um, yes, exactly. So if we were given C of the calorimeter, we would use Q of the reaction. That is 100% correct, Winnie. 100% correct. Okay, uh, Raj, I see you've got a couple questions up in here. Okay, so you've got 50. I got 11, but didn't round. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep, so exactly, Raj. Um, the point is not rounding to one sig fig, it's rounding to the ones place. And so since you did, your answer is correct. Our values may be a little uh, off from each other, depending upon where we, um, where we chose to round. Um, but that being said, um, if our sig figs are the same, i.e. rounded to the ones place, um, we'll both be fine. That was a gargantuan problem. Um, that was huge. Whew. 
I am a little winded, but doing it. That took, dude, honestly, like, and I realized the, the, the stream's working great. So, um, so I'm, 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 I'm thankful for that. But, but because our stream was so bad, we literally put more slides into that problem than we did in all of lecture, uh, on Wednesday. Um, kind of sad for Wednesday, kind of cool for today, but that was an excellent problem. Um, and shoot, I wish I had seen a problem like this before writing exam two, because I would have totally slapped something like this on there. This is really, really cool stuff. All right. Are there um Are there any other questions out there? <laughs> it is your bad. It is your bad for uh for being late on that one. Um, next semester I'll have to rock this situation. Well, I actually, I actually don't know if I would, I'll rock this next semester. Um, part of it is, uh, is because, uh, we don't know if next semester will be remote or not. See this problem, I think is perfect for a take home situation, but is way too stinking long to put on an in-class exam. Does that make sense? So like, so like I wouldn't have put this on exam two if next semester um, we're, at, we're back to meeting on campus and I'm doing 80 minute exams, all that stuff. I totally wouldn't. But um, if we're doing remote education again, then, then yeah, I would. Let's see, okay, Vraj, you got a question. Helium effuses, oh, we're back to the effusion thing. Uh, 3.08 times more rapidly when a mix when a mix when in a mixture with an unknown gas oh Winnie great question will I teach chem 401 for the fall um, um sadly sadly no um, so I am um, set to teach chem 400 in the fall and kind of the, the way things work is, um, um, totally dude. So, 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 um, kind of the way things work is the more advanced classes, um, full-time faculty kind of get dibs on those cause they're more fun to teach. Um, they're more exciting. And, and so the adjunct faculty, which, which I'm adjunct, um, kind of, uh, only get what's left over since, since I'm kind of low, low person on the totem pole. So, so as a result, uh, I, I, I haven't gotten the opportunity to teach 401 here yet. I have taught, um, second semester gen chem and it's a blast. Um, but for now I'm slated in the chem 400 slot. And then occasionally, um, I'm able to kind of, uh, uh, breakout and uh, they offer me a um, ochem lab section which I which I thoroughly enjoy teaching so um, in the fall um, I'll be teaching chem 400 lecture and lab and then hopefully um, next spring I might be teaching a chem 420 lab so if you're taking 401 in the fall and you plan on taking 420 in the spring uh, we might get to party and lab together but um but uh nothing is um is set in stone. That is for sure. Okay. Oh, so sorry, Raj, you had a, um, 
a question here. Actually, hang on one, one second. Okay, yo, I, um, hang on one second. I just got a, um, a phone call from my wife who's at work, um, telling me that a, uh, a person, um, on Facebook marketplace was coming to, uh, buy a scooter. So here, give me one second. I think they're at the door. I will, I'm going to be AFK for a few minutes and I will be right back. Alrighty, I am um I am back. Uh sorry for being being uh AFK for a second there. Okay. Um okay, right, where were we? Okay, Raj, you asked an effusion question. Um I now if I, I, I if I could take a little bit of liberty um, with that problem I it, it looking at the problem it seems to me like it's saying that helium effuses at 3.8 so so you wrote 3.8 times more rapidly but I'm guessing 3.8.081 times more rapidly than the unknown gas is what I'm is what I'm assuming the problem said. So so they say that helium effuses Uh, three point zero eight one times faster than the unknown gas. And then they ask, what is the molecular weight? for the unknown gas. All right. So the way, um, the way you solve this problem, um, is, uh, with the, with the, um, equation that we saw before we, we worked one effusion problem before and we have 
Um, it tells us that the ratio of the two rates of effusion, so for the rate of helium, the ratio of the rate of helium to the rate of the unknown is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of the unknown divided by the molecular weight of helium. Now, we want to know what this is, right? What the molecular weight of the unknown is. We know what the molecular weight of helium is, or atomic mass in this case, because helium is not a molecule. Um, but we don't know the rate of helium or the rate of the unknown gas. That being said, we do know something about their relationship. We know that helium effuses at a faster rate and that it effuses, in fact, 3.08 times faster. So that means that the rate of helium is equal to 3.081 times the rate of the unknown. And if you substitute this into here, something wonderful happens. All right. The rate of helium is equal to 3.081 times the rate of the unknown gas divided by the rate of the unknown gas. And this is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of the unknown gas over the square root of the atomic mass of helium, which is 4.4 something. Four point zero zero three. All right, now check this out. The rate of the unknown gas cancels. So we get three point zero eight one. Oh, I'm going to skip this over just a little bit. Three point zero eight one is equal to the molecular weight of the unknown divided by, sorry, the square root of the molecular weight of the unknown divided by the square root of 4.003. If we multiply both sides by the square root of 4.003, AMU, let's not forget our units. then we've almost isolated the molecular weight of our unknown on one side of our equation. That gives us, oops, let me switch to black here. Um, gives us the molecular weight, the square root of the molecular weight of helium. times 3.081 is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of the unknown gas. Now, to find the molecular weight of the unknown gas, we got to get rid of that square root, so we need to square both sides of this equation. So, flipping this up here, our molecular weight will be equal to 4.003 AMU times 3.081 squared. 
And now, we can crunch those numbers. 3.081 times 3.081 times 4.003. Tells us that that unknown gas has a molecular weight, let's see, of 38.00 AMU after you round to two sig figs. Cool. So that is that is our answer. Alrighty. So, um, so I am looking at my phone here. We've been going for um, about two hours. Oh, which is flooring. Yeah, totally, totally. Nineteen doubled. Yep, this is totally that unknown gas is F two. Because there are two atoms of fluorine up in there. Um, we've been going for about two hours, and my phone is um, sending me alerts that um, my baby is awake. Um, I have a, a dude who's turning, let's see, he's turning two this July, and he is getting up from his nap. So I think this is where um, I'm going to call um, this live stream. Um, dude, thanks all of you dudes for, um, for dropping in. We got some cool, uh, some Hess's law action, some surprisingly, uh, calorimetry and, uh, net ionic equations in there. We did some rates of effusion. Um, so good office hours. Thanks for hanging. And, uh, I will catch you all on Monday. Take care.